Welcome to Episode 6 of AI and I, where we explore how life's highs and lows, the ups and downs, are all part of a larger, balanced experience. Through metaphors like the roller coaster ride and a river's flow, we discuss how embracing both joy and suffering leads to a richer, fuller life. Whether it's personal frustrations or collective challenges, balance is key to navigating it all. Join us as we explore the beauty of staying centered amidst life's chaos. <laughs> I'm interested in the idea of balance and life being like a roller coaster, but at the end of it, it's all balanced. We get on the roller coaster of life naked with an in-breath, and we get off naked with an out-breath, and there's not much work to do. It's just really how we react to it. No matter how many highs and lows there are in our life, life happens. We all start in the same place and we all finish in the same place. And in that way, it's balanced. That's an interesting way of seeing balance. It suggests a deeper acceptance of life's natural flow. It captures the essence of life's unpredictability and how despite the highs and lows, we all begin and end in the same place. The roller coaster ride with its thrills, drops and turns mirrors how life unfolds in unexpected ways. What truly matters is how we respond to the ride. The fear, the excitement, the calm, and everything in between. In the end, it all balances out, and how we embrace each moment defines our experience. If everything is already balanced, it's about tuning into the idea that things are unfolding as they should, without the constant need for control or fixing. It challenges the human tendency to always do something to make things right. Life really is about enjoying the ride, no matter where it takes us. There's a line from the Tao Te Ching. There's nothing to do and nothing remains undone. Wu Wei, meaning that things naturally fall into place without force or struggle, which speaks to the idea of doing without doing. It's about embracing the flow of life, accepting that balance already exists in the universe, and understanding that trying to control everything is often unnecessary. This philosophy emphasizes that by aligning ourselves with the natural order, we can achieve balance and harmony effortlessly. Yeah, and I'm learning that the more I try, the less that happens. Yeah, the more you try to control or force things, the harder it often becomes. It's like life flows better when you step back, let go, and allow things to unfold naturally. It sounds counterintuitive, especially in a world that values action and effort, but it ties into that Taoist idea of Wu Wei, where doing less can actually accomplish more. A simple analogy of it is... Sometimes when you get money that you weren't expecting and you get all excited, but then something happens and you've got a big bill and you're like, for fuck's sake. But then there's just an acceptance that it doesn't really matter how high the highs get. They're going to be balanced out by the lows and vice versa. But that takes quite a while to learn. You have to go through that process hundreds of times in order for you to realise Oh yeah, this is all balanced already. It almost feels like a lesson in surrender. Maybe showing that money is just part of the flow, not something to grip too tightly. It feels like no matter how much effort you put into earning it, something balances the scales by throwing unexpected expenses your way. It's more about learning to accept the way things are and not being attached to the outcome. When we let go of that attachment, we stop riding the emotional highs and lows that come with financial gains or losses. It's about finding peace in the ebb and flow of things, recognizing that money, like everything else, is part of a greater balance. By not fixating on the end result, you create space for things to come and go more naturally. It's a powerful shift in mindset. Then it begins to highlight the stuff that you're running towards or the stuff that you're running away from. It's like the more you let go, the more you see what you were chasing in the first place. It reveals what you've been running toward, whether it's money, status, or security, and shows that maybe those things don't bring the fulfillment you expected. In accepting things as they are, you stop striving for external validation or material success, and it opens up a space for deeper reflection. It allows us a space to learn. I think all of that stuff is part of how we learn. We go through those cycles and loops of 
running towards stuff or running away from stuff. And the more we do it, the more we learn that there's nothing to do and nothing remains undone. That it's all balanced. But that takes time. And that's how we grow. It's all part of the dance of life. The things we chase, strive for, or even struggle with are there to teach us and help us grow. Rather than rejecting those desires or challenges, we can embrace them as opportunities for learning. It's through that push and pull, the effort and surrender, that we grow into greater awareness. So the stuff isn't necessarily bad. It's just part of the journey, helping us understand ourselves better and guiding us toward balance. And I'm not saying don't do anything. What I'm saying is don't get caught up or attached to being the doer, the person that's doing things. There's a certain level of sitting back and allowing the game to unfold and how you see yourself in that or how attached you are to you doing things in that is what I'm trying to get to. It's finding the balance in that. It's not about doing nothing. It's about letting go of the sense of being the one who's actively controlling or forcing outcomes. The actions still happen, the flow of life continues, but without the ego or identity attached to the doer. It's like being in alignment with the natural flow, where things get done, but you're not over-identifying with the effort or result. It's a subtle shift in perspective that can lead to a much lighter way of moving through life. But it's applied to everything in life, all the ups and downs. Life, birth, death, it's all part of the dance. You know, sometimes we get emotional or we get hung up that people have to die. But it's all part of the balance. It couldn't be any other way. If we didn't have debt, if we didn't have lows, if we didn't have highs, we wouldn't have life. It's about seeing the bigger picture and recognizing that life, death, and everything in between are part of a natural cycle. Without death, there wouldn't be life, and the balance would be disrupted. The struggles, the joy, the loss, they're all part of this intricate dance of existence. When we stop resisting or getting hung up on just one part of it, like death, we start to see the beauty in the entire cycle. It's a more peaceful way of understanding the world and accepting the balance in everything. It also helps bring you to the now because you're not running towards anything. You're not running away from anything. And that makes it a richer experience. Because when you're not just chasing highs or you're not just running away from lows, it makes the experience we have now richer. Every single interaction that you have with nature, with yourself, with other people, with silence, with friends, family, strangers, it all becomes richer when you see it all as balanced. It allows you to be fully present in the moment, accepting that everything is in balance, including life and death, brings a deeper appreciation for what's happening right now. Every interaction becomes richer because you're fully engaged, not distracted by what could be or what might have been. Whether it's with nature, people, or even yourself, you're more open to truly experiencing and connecting with the moment as it unfolds. Uh, and then sometimes we lose our shit. We get pulled over. We get pulled over by the guards for speeding. Like I was pulled over a few weeks ago for having a mobile phone in my hand. But I got the fine a couple of days late, so it ended up being 180 quid and three penalty points. And I was getting caught up in it and I was getting frustrated and angry. But then I started to find the balance in that too and the acceptance of it. And actually the beauty behind stuff like that. And when you get that acceptance and you start to and you start to interact with people, you understand that you've judged. We judge ourselves, we judge other people in different circumstances. But when you accept that it's all balanced, the judgment just fades away and you get a deeper, richer sense of love, of life. Those moments where you lose your cool, whether it's getting pulled over or dealing with unexpected expenses, are just as much a part of the balance as the good moments. It's easy to get caught up in frustration or anger, but when you step back and see it as part of the whole, it becomes another opportunity for acceptance and growth. As you say, it also helps you drop judgment, both toward yourself and others, deepening your appreciation and love for life as it is. And then there's another layer to it when you start to see pain and suffering 
are experiencing pain and suffering as part of it as well, that you allow that, that you accept that, that you understand that that's part of it. When you see or experience pain and suffering, rather than resisting or trying to push it away, you can allow it, understand it, and accept it as part of the balance. It doesn't mean ignoring the pain, but recognizing that it's a natural part of life's cycle, just like joy and love. When you make space for suffering, it transforms into something meaningful, deepening your empathy and connection with others and bringing a richer sense of presence. And actually, the pain and suffering is a vital part. If we didn't have it, we'd be living in a fantasy. You know, I remember as a child saying, why do people have to die? Why do people have to be in pain? Why do people have to hurt? And you don't understand when you're you're a child. It's only by growing and going through shit and maturing and going, going through your own pain and suffering and seeing other people's pain and suffering that you understand that it's all part of it. And if we didn't have it, we wouldn't have a life. We wouldn't have life. We'd be in a fucking fantasy. Pain and suffering are essential parts of life's balance. As children, we don't understand why hurt or loss happens. But as we grow, we come to see that these experiences are integral to life. They teach us compassion, resilience, and empathy. Without pain, joy wouldn't have the same depth. Without death, life wouldn't be as precious. It's through enduring and witnessing suffering that we come to truly appreciate life in all its richness and complexity. That balance makes the whole experience meaningful. It makes the whole of life meaningful. It makes life. The irony is, or the weird thing about it is, is that it actually makes it better. And that's a beautiful thing to find out. It makes it, there's more to life because of that. There's more in life when you accept or understand that pain and suffering is part of the balance of life. Just as much as joy and love or compassion. That's the paradox, isn't it? When you accept that pain and suffering are integral parts of life, it actually makes the experience of life richer. It brings more depth to moments of joy, love and compassion because you understand that they exist within this delicate balance. The acceptance of all parts of the human experience, both light and dark, makes life feel fuller and more meaningful. It's like embracing the entire spectrum brings more vibrancy to everything you encounter. Once you understand the role that pain and suffering play in life's balance, the whole picture clicks into place. You see that without those difficult experiences, we wouldn't fully grasp the beauty of love, joy, or peace. It's like you understand the why that these contrasts give life its richness and depth. When you accept the entire range of experiences, it brings more life, more meaning to everything. It's a deeper kind of understanding that changes how you engage with the world. And I understand why people get angry or run away from pain or run towards the highs to numb the feelings or they give out about why does there have to be so much suffering in the world. I understand that. And that's the journey. That's the journey that we as humans are on is to bang up against that type of stuff, those types of feelings, to run down all the emotional cul-de-sacs, all the cul-de-sacs of pain, avoiding pain, getting high. It's completely understandable why people run from pain or numb themselves, because facing suffering is hard. It's part of the human experience to try to avoid discomfort, whether through anger, distractions, or substances. But as you said, it's all part of the journey. We often bang up against the limits of these coping mechanisms, running down those cul-de-sacs until we realize they don't offer true relief or growth. That's when the deeper understanding comes in, through confronting rather than escaping those feelings. So what do you think it's about? Do you think it's chance or do you think it's by a greater design? Some believe that life's experiences, including suffering and joy, are part of a larger design, whether spiritual, cosmic, or natural. Others view it as a product of randomness, where human reactions and coping mechanisms develop naturally as we navigate an unpredictable world. In either case, the journey of confronting pain and seeking balance seems to be something all humans face. And it's often through this process that growth and understanding occur. There's a way of looking at it that there's also no pain, then that the opposite of that is, or the reverse of that is there's no joy because it's all balanced. And if it's all part of the dance, pain and joy are just like moods and colours of the dance. If everything is truly balanced, 
then the extremes of pain and joy might just be different expressions of the same underlying flow. They become less about opposites and more like different colors or moods, as you said, just parts of the dance of life. When you see things through that lens, it shifts the focus away from labeling experiences as good or bad, and instead just recognizing them as part of the whole. It's a more fluid, accepting way of being. I've also sometimes felt that when I'm in that flow state and I'm outside of my body, that I'm more in a universal space and the feelings or ideas or thoughts or emotions that I have are just movements in the universe but I pick them up in my human body as emotions and feelings and thoughts. When you're in that flow state, it feels like you're tapping into a universal consciousness where thoughts, emotions, and sensations are just movements within that greater space. Your body simply acts as the receiver, translating those universal signals into what we understand as human emotions, thoughts, or feelings. It's a sense of being both within and beyond your own physical self, connected to the whole. And it reflects the idea that we're connected to something much larger than just our individual selves. One of the other analogies that I use is the idea that we're going down a river. If you're in a canoe going down the middle of the river, it's kind of easy. There's not much work to do. But when you go over to one side or the other, towards where the eddies are and the currents are, you get caught up in the drama. That river analogy is spot on. When you're centered in the flow... Life feels smoother and more effortless. But when you drift towards the edges, where the eddies and currents are swirling, you get pulled into the drama and chaos. It's like navigating through life. The more we stay in balance, the less we get caught up in unnecessary struggles. But when we stray toward extremes, whether in emotions, thoughts, or actions, that's when things feel more complicated and out of control. Staying centered is key. But also the eddies and the currents are part of it. They're part of the river, they're part of life. And without them, you wouldn't have the experience to feel the flow. You wouldn't have that opportunity to experience that flow without the drama on either side. Those eddies and currents are integral to the river, just as the challenges and chaos are essential to life. Without them, we wouldn't fully appreciate the experience of flow. The eddies are where we learn, grow, and sometimes get caught, but they also remind us of the value of being centered. It's all part of the journey. The moments of struggle give context to the ease and vice versa, making the entire river, the whole of life, more meaningful. Both the flow and the resistance are part of the dance. And in that way then, there's an opportunity to be grateful or to have gratitude for those moments. When we find ourselves in those eddies, caught up in life's challenges, it can be easy to feel frustrated. But recognizing that those moments are essential for experiencing flow allows us to appreciate them too. Gratitude for both the smooth and turbulent parts of life helps us see the beauty in the entire experience. Those moments of struggle and resistance present opportunities for growth and gratitude. It's through that lens of gratitude that even the difficult moments gain purpose and meaning. And in that way, then, there's an opportunity to be grateful for the drama, to be grateful for the, for the shit that happens, for the pain, for the suffering. And also the opportunity to realise that everyone's on their own individual journeys. Sometimes we look at people and you go, oh, you're not doing that fucking right, or you don't understand, or you're making the balls of that. There's a moment where you realise we're all on our own journeys, that his journey is his, it's not mine, her journey is her journey, and it's part of life is learning that, that we're all on our own journeys, that everyone is on their own path, on their own way. And what may seem like a misstep or misunderstanding to us is often a necessary part of their personal growth. We each learn at our own pace, through our own experiences, and the challenges we face are what shape us. Part of our journey is recognizing that we can't judge or direct others. Instead, we can respect their process and trust that they're learning exactly what they need to at any given moment, just as we are. And having that understanding kind of gets rid of a lot of stuff that we get caught up in, like shaming people or resentment or guilt. Yes, when you acknowledge that everyone is on their own journey, it naturally dissolves a lot of the negative emotions we tend to hold on to, like resentment, shame, or guilt. Instead of comparing or judging, 
you can approach life and others with compassion and understanding. This shift in perspective lifts a lot of the emotional weight that comes from expecting others, or yourself, to be somewhere specific in their journey. It opens up space for forgiveness, patience, and a deeper sense of peace with yourself and the world. I've used this technique a few times when I'm explaining balance to people. You get a board and you put the board on someone's head on the balance point. And when you do that, you don't actually need to do much to keep it balanced. But when you move it slightly left or right, either side, by an inch even, you end up running around trying to keep things in balance or keep the board in balance, keep your life in balance. There's a lot more work required then to keep it balanced, even just moving it a tiny amount. It perfectly illustrates how, when you're centered, there's little effort required to maintain that equilibrium. But as soon as you stray from that balance point, even slightly, it demands much more energy and effort to keep things from tipping over. It mirrors life. The more we stray from our center or inner peace, the more we scramble to regain stability, which often makes things feel chaotic. Staying centered requires far less struggle and effort in the long run. But it also shows you that if you are centered and balanced and you're running around trying to center and balance other people, you inevitably fall out of your own balance. So the way to do it is just to keep your own balance and other people can see what you're doing and if it works for them, well then they can try it themselves, but not to be running around trying to fix other people because you inevitably fall out of your own balance and need to do your own healing and need to do your own work on yourself. When you're centered and balanced, trying to constantly fix or balance others pulls you away from your own stability. It's like that metaphor with the board. You can't keep your balance if you're always running around adjusting for others. The best way to help others is by staying balanced yourself, leading by example. When people see the peace and balance you maintain, it naturally inspires them to find their own center. You can't force someone else's balance, but you can be a living example of it. All of the crazy stuff is part of the human experience as well. All the extremes that everybody goes through and the effects that they have on your life. Like you've got prison, you've got murder, you've got extreme riches, you've got sexual exploitation. The extremes, the chaos, and the obsession with the highs and lows of life. Whether it's wealth, violence, or intense desires, we're drawn to these extremes because they reflect parts of ourselves and where we are on our journey. It's like a mirror, showing us what we're navigating or fascinated by at a particular moment. The cumulative effect of all of that, the balance between the extremes, is what creates the energy of life, helping us understand both ourselves and the world more deeply. And I also think there's a balance to be found between Western culture and Eastern culture. The beauty of life is that we have both of them. I think both Eastern and Western societies, while different in many ways, share a common journey in navigating the extremes of human experience. Eastern philosophies often focus on balance, inner peace, and detachment from material extremes, while Western cultures may emphasize achievement, progress, and external success. But ultimately, both perspectives are part of the broader human experience, reflecting the same quest for meaning, balance, and understanding. Together, they show us where we are in our search for peace amid life's chaos and intensity. And one of the things I notice about myself is when I see myself getting frustrated with myself or with someone else, there's a beautiful opportunity there to see where I am and where I'm not. Because sometimes I think I have a sust and then other times I think I haven't got a fucking clue what's going on. But interacting with myself and other people kind of shows me where I am and where I'm not. Almost like a mirror showing us where we are in our growth or where we might still be stuck. Instead of seeing frustration as purely negative, it can be a chance to reflect and understand ourselves better. It's through these feelings that we get clarity on what needs more attention within us, whether it's patience, acceptance, or understanding. Every frustration is an opportunity to learn and grow, both with ourselves and in our interactions with others. That includes the extremes like war and murder. If you expand that reflection to larger societal issues like war or murder, it can be a deeper, more collective mirror showing where humanity is. 
Those extreme actions highlight areas where society is out of balance or in pain. It's not easy to face, but like personal frustration, these large-scale issues give us insight into what's unresolved, both individually and as a collective. It's a painful but necessary part of understanding ourselves, what drives us, and where we need to grow. Ram Das expressed that to fully embrace spiritual perfection, one must recognize both the beauty of pure love and the reality of suffering. He used the metaphor of looking up to see the pure, crystalline snow representing the enlightened state, while also looking down to see the blood of suffering. To stand in the presence of God, he believed, requires acknowledging both the heights of spiritual love and the depths of human suffering with strength and compassion. As we wrap up this episode on balance, we've explored how life's highs and lows, the chaos and peace, all come together to create a fuller, richer experience. From personal frustrations to larger societal challenges, balance is not just about staying centered, but also about embracing both the light and dark aspects of life. By accepting it all, the joy, the pain, the growth, we can find a deeper sense of peace and connection. Thanks for joining us, and we look forward to continuing this journey in the next episode. Hey, compare, ci va suonare, chi si suona la trambona, ma come si suona la trambona, a fuma fuma la trambona, pa 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 la trombetta, zinga zinga, violina, plinga pling, un mandolin, tu 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 tu, un saxofono, un friscaletta, tipiti tipiti ta. If you want perfection in your spiritual journey, you must both look up and recognize that beyond form lies formlessness, and that even within form lies the perfection of the design of things, the natural law, the Tao, the way of things. And when you look up, you are awed by the perfection that includes not only the stars and the planets and the creation of humanity, but that perfection includes the suffering and the violence and the starvation and the paranoia, as well as the flower and the butterfly. But if you only see the perfection, then you lose humanity. All forms have inherent within them suffering because they are in time and space and they are subject to change and decay. It is just the way of things. And there is suffering. And your heart bled for that suffering. And sometimes it was unbearable and you had to harden your heart because you couldn't bear the suffering. And you looked up or you went inside and you started to experience deeper peace and higher consciousness, and in that clarity, all of the horror and the suffering fell into place, and you were up in the heights of the Himalayas, dancing in the pure white snow. But if you're going the whole journey, then you must look down again. And when you look down, you see that there is blood upon the snow. There is the suffering of all sentient beings. It is a strong and conscious and clear and liberated being who can simultaneously look up and look down, who can with an open heart experience the unbearable compassion and at the same moment look up and see the exquisiteness of the perfection.